Good morning, church. Please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 11. We're continuing our series through the book of Romans, and we come to the conclusion this morning of a section that began in Romans chapter 9, and I want us to read Romans chapter 11, verse 1 to 36 together. And then we will focus mainly on verses 25 to 36. This is on the Pew Bible, page 947. Picking up in Romans chapter 11, verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what was God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I ask, Did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered is for first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, he's speaking of the Gentiles here, and you, although a wild offshoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember that it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness towards you provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, 
The natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree, lest you be wise in your own sight. I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so too they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gi- him a gift to be, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask your help, Lord. God, we're concerned because we want to hear and understand what Paul is warning us about, especially as a church who is primarily made up of Gentiles, God. And as Paul turns in this text to to warn Gentiles and how they're viewing Israel and how they're viewing Jews, Lord, would you please help us to understand and come to a knowledge of the truth? God, I confess that my own interpretation of your word is not infallible. I can err, Lord, but your word cannot. So I pray, Father, In doing my best to explain these things and how I understand them, Lord, I pray, Father, that if anything I teach is not correct, God, that it would fall by the side, that it would be forgotten, that it would be refuted, and that I could publicly repent. Lord, we want to understand what you're saying here. There's a lot of different understandings and views concerning these verses. So, Lord, we need you by your spirit to enlighten us and lead us into the truth so that we might be a humble people, Lord, and so that we might get a glimpse of what you're doing and what you have promised for the future of this world for both Gentiles and Jews and for Gentile nations and for Israel as a nation. God, you're sovereign and you're in control of all of these things. And we recognize, God, that you are a God who is faithful. And we see your faithfulness on display as you reassure us of your promises in this text. So help us to, ca- capture, help us to understand it, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you'd bless us, that we might enjoy it, that we might be aware of it, and that we might be in awe of it, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What in the world is going on? What's God doing in the world right now? Does God have a plan for the things that are going on right now? Does he have a plan for for where history is heading? Has Has he revealed that? Has he made these things clear to us? Has he has he spoken? Has he revealed to us what he intends to do? I think he has. I think he has. We, we, we get a glimpse in these verses of, of, of God's sovereign 
plan of salvation wherein he bestows mercy on Jews and Gentiles alike. And he does it in such a way that at the end of the day, God can be praised because he is the God who shows mercy to all. What a God. What an amazing God. But he also wants us to see something of the way that that will happen. He wants us to understand these movements that he's making in the history of salvation or in the the progress of history of God's dealings with, with, with man. What is he up to? He reveals these things to us in this text. I've entitled this sermon, The Mystery of God's Mercy in Salvation History. And and the main idea is this, that if we are aware of the mystery of how God has mercy on Jews and Gentiles in salvation history, then we will be a humble and a united people who together are in awe of God and declare to him, to you be the glory. To you be the glory. That Jew and Gentile alike could be united in rejoicing and saying together, as Paul wants them to say, as he says in Romans chapter 15, verse 5, that they live in such harmony with one another and that they with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this text does. This text pulls together so many different themes that have been hit on so so far in the book of Romans. It it hits on the fact that God is absolutely faithful to his promises. It hits on the fact that God is sovereign and, and showing mercy to those who are disobedient and choosing them and saving them, not because of anything good that they have done. And it, it hits on also the fact that Israel rejected their Messiah in his first coming. And that they are held accountable and responsible for that. And that they need to turn and believe and repent of their sins and accept Jesus as their Messiah. But more than that, we see in Romans 11 that this is in fact what Israel will do. This is in fact what Israel will do. And so as we look at our, 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 our text this morning... I broke it into two points. The first is to be aware, and the second is to be in awe. Because if we're not aware of what God is doing in his sovereign plan in history, then we're going to have a wrong understanding. And we're going to then think and act and, and, and even possibly treat people based on a wrong understanding. But if we're aware, then we're going to be the type of people who Paul speaks of here that, that, that are Gentiles, who are humble, who are not proud, who are not arrogant towards Jews or towards Israel, but fear God and hold on to God by faith. That's what he wants. And that's what Paul wanted in the Roman church, a church that is mixed of Jews and Gentiles. And they're, trying, they're rubbing shoulders and trying to figure out how are we going to live out our faith together. How many of you know that there's, there's a terrible history of Gentile and Jew relationships in the world? And not only in the world, but you could say in the history of the church, especially the history of what we call the Roman Catholic Church. And you, can, you could read about that. Michael Brown has written a book that, that catalogs some of that called Our Hands Are Stained With Blood. There's been much persecution done even by the church upon Jews in our history. That's heartbreaking. I think that that is absolutely a result of not hearing and heeding what Paul is addressing in this text. And so lest we be wise in our own sight, as Paul says here, we need to be aware. 
of what God is doing and what God has planned. And so as we work through this first point, he's going to state the mystery. He's going to support the mystery. He's going to expound this mystery and, and, and come to the ultimate sovereign purpose of this whole thing, which is God's mercy on all. And then secondly, we're going to want to join Paul and be in awe of God because of this. And so let's get into the text. First, we are to be aware. Be aware, brothers and sisters. Paul warns the Gentiles, says, lest you be wise in your own sight, I I want you to understand this mystery. You got to get this, and I'm going to lay it out for you clearly. So understand it. Because this will impact Jew and Gentile relationships and also Jew and Gentile expectations in regards to the future. What God has in plan and in store for both of them. You want to all be on the same page in this. Because then that's going to bless the way that you relate and the way that you hope and the way that you wait together. And glorify me together and serve me together. And so he unfolds this mystery in four parts. First, Israel's hardening is partial. Look at what it says here. Paul says, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel. When Paul says that a partial hardening has come upon Israel, he's speaking. Who who, who is Israel? Well, Israel is the ethnic or national people, the corporate people who are, as Paul already said, defines in 11, chapter 11, verse 1, he says, I myself am an Israelite. What does that mean, Paul? A descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. We go back in chapter 9, we see also Paul describe who he's talking about. Who, who, who's, who, are the, who is Israel? He says that they are his kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, chapter 9, verse 4. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belongs the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So what is this partial hardening, speaking of, that's come upon the ethnic national people of Israel in Paul's day? Well, it's that they rejected their Messiah, and God, in judgment, has hardened their hearts. He has handed over the majority of Israel, and in Paul's day, he's handed them over and and darkened their minds, just as we we saw in Romans chapter 1, what God does in judgment is he gives people up to do what their evil desires want to do. And so that's the partial hardening. And so what Paul is, has experienced in his own day is that out of the, the ethnic national people of Israel, God has done a thing where, where he has divided between them. If this is the group of, of ethnic Jews in Paul's day, God has separated between them, between those who are a remnant, who he has shown mercy to, whom he has saved, whom he has called, whom he has elected and chosen, and the rest of them are those who rejected the Lord and have been hardened, and they make up the majority of Israel. So that hardening is on the majority, but not all of them. And that's how Paul could say, you can know for a fact today, even though you think my gospel makes it sound like God's rejected his people, God hasn't rejected his people because this hardening is only partial. But more than that, the next thing you need to realize is we also know that God hasn't rejected his people because this hardening upon them is temporary. It's temporary. This is the second part that he, that, that he, he hits on. And so we see then that it is it is a, a temporary hardening. We see this in verse 25 when it says, A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So what we can, what we can see here is in this, in this statement of until, there is a temporal aspect to it. Now, there's people who disagree with this and would say that the, 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 word, the word used here uh, in, in this case isn't speaking of a reversal of circumstances, but it's just speaking about how things are going to be until the end. 
So read it with me again. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So you can either understand this in a terminative sense. It's going. The hardening is there until the fullness is reached. And that's all he's saying. Or the hardening is there until the fullness is reached. And then there's going to be reversal. That hardening is going to be removed. Are you, you track with those two, those two ideas. And, and so those are, those are two different takes on, on, on this statement. Now, I take it, as you can tell from my notes, I say hard, Israel's hardening is temporary, right? So I'm telling you what, what I, what I, what I, how I understand that, that Greek word to be functioning. Why do I think that? Well, when we, when we look at this word, it is the common usage of that word for it to indicate reversal. In the majority of the instances that this word is used in the New Testament, the majority, all right, this is the majority instance, the majority, the majority of them are used to indicate a change of circumstances. Something's going that way, and then until this happens, and the, the circumstances are reversed. Uh, 27 of 37 uses refer to a period of time that will come to an end, followed by a change in circumstances. And this is admitted by the other side. Uh, Sam Storms is one commentator who takes this terminative view, um, and he concedes this is not its most frequent sense, and that those who adopt such a view are admittedly going with a rare sense of the, the, the word here, until. Uh, for, for one reference to look at that I think is, 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 is similar, um, we could turn to Luke 21, which says in Luke 21, verse 24, you can just write it down, I'll read it for you. It says, that, that, that speaking of the Jews, that they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And so again, what you're seeing here is what is going to be the case. Jerusalem's trampled underfoot until we're until then brings a change of circumstances and they're no longer trampled underfoot after the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And so that's what I think that Paul is doing here. There's other clues in, in the context of Romans 11 that also point in this direction. When we look at chapter 11, verse 12, Paul has mentioned that Israel's trespass and, and their failure, that the majority of them rejected their Messiah, and that when they rejected their Messiah, chapter 11, verse 12, it says that this means riches for the world. And then it says, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? And so there is an anticipated reversal. He's saying that they, if they were blessed, when it's, if God blessed the Gentiles when Israel was disobedient, just imagine what's going to happen when Israel is obedient. It's going to be like life from the dead. We see this again also in, in verse 15 where it says that if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? The same, it has to be the same group. The same group that rejected ethnic national Israel, rejected their Messiah, but then they are, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? And so these things together then indicate that there is a, there is a, a, a temporal uh, understanding here and that there's a partial hardening on Israel. It's partial. It's temporary. It will cease and it will be removed when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so then that leads us to ask, what is the fullness of, of, the, of, of the Gentiles? Uh, and that can either be a full, the full complete number of Gentiles or, or God's purposes in saving Gentiles and using them to provoke Israel to jealousy. When he's done doing that, when he's done with that play, then he's going to turn back and show mercy to Israel, remove their hardening and save them. This then leads to this last part where it says that all Israel, in this way, all Israel will be saved. And as we look at this verse, if you take this verse by itself, this verse as well, people could land in a number of different places. There's three main views on this. The first is this, that when it says that in this way, all Israel will be saved, 
that it is referring to the sum total of God's elect from both Jews and Gentiles. So the idea is that, that and they would prefer that, that, that this terminative sense, there's a, a partial hardening on Israel that continues until God's saving purposes are done. And while God's saving people, he's saving Gentiles and he's saving Jews. And the total number of both those Jews and Gentiles are the all Israel that God is saving. They're Israel in a spiritual sense. They're spiritual Israel. They're true Israel, and that includes Gentiles and, uh, and Jews. John Calvin held that view. Uh, I respect John Calvin and like John Calvin a lot and agree with him on a lot of things, but that's not one of them. As we see Paul's definition of Israel, and in every other instance, Israel being used in the book of Romans, and especially chapters 9 through 11, it's always referring to ethnic, national people. And so I don't think there's room for Gentiles in, in, in ethnic Israel, if that makes sense, without there being a breakdown of just the common sense meaning of, of words. And so I don't think that in this way all Israel will be saved is just the sum total of the elective Jew or Gentile as John Calvin does. The next view that is held is that this is speaking of the sum of the elect remnant within Israel, meaning that, that all Israel who will be saved, they take that terminative sense again. So God is, is, is saving because Israel's hardening will continue until God's done saving people and he's saving, kind of picking them up here and there. And at the end, all of the ones who God over time saved will be all of Israel and they'll be saved. Um, I think that view is better than Calvin's view because at least he's, at least he's, at least that view uh, respects the the definition of Israel in the ethnic sense. Uh, but at the same time, I would disagree with it because the until shows that there's going to be a reversal. And if this until shows that there's going to be a reversal, then I would go with a third view that's expecting a future, as it says, in this way all Israel will be saved, a future mass turning of ethnic Israel to the Lord. I think that's what, what Paul is talking about here. I think it's again what he's mentioned when he talks about if their rejection meant this, then what will their acceptance be? And so... Uh, a, a few reasons why I think that this is, this is helpful uh, and, and right to, to see this is that Paul, again, has consistently used the term Israel to refer to them as an ethnic nation. Uh, not only that, if you go with one of the other two views, you actually have to change in your understanding of Israel from verse 25 to verse 26. They would say that both of the other views that the partial hardening has come upon Israel and the Israel there, they all agree, that's ethnic Israel. But then in the next verse, how are we going to say that it's Gentiles and Jews? So that, that causes a, a problem. Not only that, I, I really appreciated an insight by uh, D.A. Carson. He noted that, he, he, he speaks about how uh, a reinterpretation of Israel can hardly be reconciled with the apostles' opening lament for his people in chapter 9 when Paul says, I'm not lying. I have a great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ. That's a, that's a lament. He's crying out to God. He's praying for them in chapter, chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for them to be saved. And so he's lamenting the fact that, that Israel has not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what D.A. Carson observes is he says that biblical lament arises only in the face of an unanswered promise. Do you get that? That biblical lament, the reason that you can cry out to God and say, this should not be the case, and Lord, please do something about this is because it's based on clear promises of God. And that's why you have every right to cry out to him and to say that this is not right and that this is wrong and we long for the day. How long, O oh Lord? How long will it be? 
You can lament that fact because it's promised. And so these things together, and I think that as we keep going, as we look at how Paul supports this from Scripture, we'll make it abundantly clear that this is speaking of a future mass salvation, restoration, conversion of ethnic national Israel. Let's keep going. So Paul then uh, supports, supports it with Scripture. And let me just address one thing here. Some people are bothered by the idea that God would all of a sudden just like save all those people at once. And that that, you know, that that, what about the other generations of Jews? And that's a, that's a legitimate question. But the problem with that, and, and one of the things that I came across here that I thought was fascinating, was uh, one, one author, last name Trench, said when he was preaching on the parables, he said that we Gentiles must not forget that at the end of the present dispensation, all will be reversed. And that we shall be in danger of playing the part of the elder brother. Speaking of the prodigal son. Do you guys remember the elder brother? He's not happy when his brother comes back, right? So he said these things are going to be switched. And Gentiles have the temptation to play the part of the elder brother. And, and, and shall do so if we begrudge at the largeness of the grace bestowed upon the Jew. Who is now feeding upon the husks far away from his father's house. Right? God has mercy on whom he has mercy. It's not, it's, it's not an argument to say, well, why, what about the others? God has mercy on whom he has mercy. So if he decides in, 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 to demonstrate his faithfulness and fulfillment of his promises to save a future massive group of Israel and restore them as a nation, then he has every prerogative to do so. And... That's not just his prerogative, but it's his promise. Let's see this in the mystery supported. Paul supports his argument. He goes to two main texts, Isaiah 59 and Isaiah 27. Since I'm already going long, you have to come over to my house and we can can dig real deep into those. But let me just tell you that that in Isaiah 59 and Isaiah uh, uh, 27, that both of those support the truth that all Israel will be saved. And they do so with the precise verses that Paul quotes. They do so in the very context in which they are written. And they, they do so by connection of key words that are mentioned here that are then picked up by other prophets in the prophets, such as Jeremiah and such as Zechariah and Ezekiel, and are magnified and clarified in the hope that is stated there for the future salvation of Israel is crystal clear. It's amazing. You just go back and read it. And so first, though, let's look briefly at Isaiah 59. In Isaiah 59, we see this is, comes in the context of Isaiah 40 to 66. What's going on in Isaiah 40 to 66? God says, comfort, comfort, speak tenderly to my people. He go out and preach good news to them. For the Lord your God, behold, he comes. And he's going to come with his arm ruling for him. And if you want to do a little word study on his arm, you can see that his arm is, is a messianic reference. And you can see that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to rule and that that's the expectation at his, at his return. And so in Isaiah 59, though, to be in, in particular, we see in verses 1 through 8 an indictment upon Israel for their sin. Then in verses 9 through 5, we see a lament and admission of Israel's sinfulness. They're like, and this is probably Isaiah speaking and admitting these things on behalf of their nation. It says, for our transgressions are multiplied before you. Our sins testify against us. He says, there is no justice. And in verse 15 Uh, In verse 15 and 16, it says that the Lord saw there was no justice and it displeased him and and wondered that, that no man was there to intercede for them. And then his own arm brought salvation. It says, according to their deeds, I will repay. And then jumping down, it says, how, how will this happen? How is God going to bring salvation? How is he going to bring justice on the earth and to Israel? It says that a redeemer will come to Zion. That's how he's going to do it. And when that redeemer comes to Zion, he's going to then put his spirit on the people of Israel, and he's going to change them. Look at what it, look at what it says here in Isaiah 59. 
It says here, a redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who turn from the transgression. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth or from the mouth of your offspring or from the mouth of your children offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. What is this indicating? It's indicating his Redeemer coming, his Redeemer banishing, ridding Jacob of ungodliness, forgiving her sins, making them a holy people, and giving them his Holy Spirit so that they have, their, their, that they have God's word in their heart and in their mouth, and they live as an obedient people forever. That's what, it's, that's what it's saying here. And if you keep going in Isaiah, look at Isaiah 60 verse 1. It says, arise, shine, for your light has come. This is, this is what has happened. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. It's speaking to Israel. And we know this in verse 5. It says, you shall, you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because of the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you and the wealth of the nations shall come to you. And he talks about how he's going to, jumping down to verse 11, that Israel's gates will be open continually, day and, not, day and night not be shut, and the people that the people may bring into you the wealth of the nations and their kings led in procession. If you move down to chapter 60, verse, uh, verse 21, it says that your people shall all be righteous. What a statement. Do you hear that? Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. All Israel will be saved. Let's look at, if we, we think about Isaiah chapter 27, we recognize that in Isaiah 27 that this is taking place in the context of Isaiah 24 to 27, which you could read it, it's not too long, but it's, it's sometimes called Isaiah's little apocalypse. It's pretty much a view, it's an unveiling. Apocalypse just means the unveiling of the end. And so what you read in chapter 24 is there's gonna be mad judgment on the nations. They're gonna get wrecked. Then in chapter 25, there's gonna be more judgment on the nations, but also there's gonna be nations who are saved too, who waited faithfully for the Lord. And then in chapter 26, this is going to be the song that is sung when, when, when after salvation arrives, they sing in chapter 26, verse 2, open the gates. And notice that this is the song sung in the land of Judah. Open the gates. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. And then lastly, we get to chapter 27, which is this is ultimate, just crazy cool statement in chapter 27, verse 1, speaking of what God is going to do when he comes in judgment, says that in that day, with his, ha with his uh, hard and great and strong sword, will punish the Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, and Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. What's going on there? I can't get into that, but He's going to wreck whatever enemies are there. It's going to be no problem. He's going to have a giant sword to do it. No problem. And then look at what it says here. This is the chapter that he's, he's quoting from. It says that in that day a pleasant vineyard, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it. Think how tender and sweet this is. So he's speaking of Israel. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it. I keep it day and night. I have no wrath. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle. It's, like, it's, it's completely peaceful. I would march against them. I would, I would burn them up together or let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me and let them make peace with me. And then it says, in days to come, Jacob shall take root, Israel shall blossom, put forth shoots, and fill the whole world with fruit. What a glorious picture. That's exactly what he's talking about when he says how much more blessing riches will come to the whole rest of the world when the fullness of Israel comes. And we see then in verse 9, it says that therefore by this the guilt of Jacob will be atoned for and this will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin. Or the, the Greek Septuagint translate this verse that this, this is the blessing of the removal of his sin and, and speaks of, sorry, this is the blessing when I take away his sins. And that is this, the verse that Paul's pulling on when he talks about after saying that, 
that I will make my covenant with them. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so what do we, what do we get from, from all these verses? This isn't even going into statements about studies about covenant. When covenant is mentioned here, I said it's picked up by Jeremiah, it's picked up by Ezekiel, it's picked up by Zechariah. All study it in their, con- in, their, in their context refers to the salvation of Israel. And so putting these things together, it's, it's clear that Israel's hardening is partial. It's right now, it's, and it's also temporary. It's, it's, it's going to come to an end, and it's going to be reversed, and all all Israel will be saved. This is in accord with all that the prophets have laid out f- for us. And so then Paul expounds this mystery as we keep going. Paul expounds this mystery and says, well, then what are we to make of Israel now? Because they're in a kind of an w- interesting position. That, so we know that that's going to happen. But right now, they don't like us because we're preaching Christ. So what do we do with this? And Paul says, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. So what is, what is Paul saying here? Is that Israel right now has a dual status. And it's continued from Paul's day to our day. Israel right now has a dual status. You're like, what, do I, what am I to think of Israel? What am I to think of my, 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 my Jewish friend who doesn't believe in Christ? You think of them as having this dual status. Because they reject the gospel, and they reject Messiah, they are God's enemy. But at the very same time, their rejection of the gospel has not caused God to say, you know those promises I made? No, I'm not going to do that anymore. As Paul mentioned in Romans chapter 3, he says, will the unfaithfulness of men nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone else were a liar. If there was only one Jew left in this world, God would still find a way to fulfill his promises. And maybe that you die, he'd raise up another one from the dead and say, all right, let's keep this thing going. God has to fulfill this. This is what he's, what he's promised. And, and they're, so they're enemies because they reject Christ by the same time, beloved, for the sake of their forefathers. God said to Abraham, I will make you a great nation. And in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's irrevocable. And, and so uh, just w- what great hope, what great motivation for us to preach to our Jewish friends that, that we, this hope that you have for Israel's restoration, we believe that as well. But you got to get right with Messiah because you won't be in there. You're not going to make it in if he returns and you're in rebellion against him. There's no way. Paul's already made it clear the only way in is if they do not continue in their unbelief. They have to stop their unbelief. They have to turn to Christ. They have to be saved. And that's what's going to happen in a future day when God does this. And Paul makes this more clear as he expounds the future status of Israel in verses 30 and 32. And notice, I want you to just catch the argument here. He says in Romans 11, verse 30 to 32, that just as you, speaking of Gentiles, just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so, so what, is, what is he saying? He's saying, you Gentiles, in the exact same way that you were disobedient and you've now received mercy, so the same thing is going to be for Israel because they're disobedient right now and God's going to show them mercy. The way he says it is a little bit confusing because he's also emphasizing how all of the blessings that the Gentiles have are mediated to them through Israel. Look at what this says. Look at this closely. As regards the, uh, verse 30, for just as you were one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy, why? Because of their disobedience. And it says, then so too have they now been disobedient. The majority of Israel has been hardened and rejected their Messiah. In order that, the purpose of this is so that mercy shown to you, you might be saved, and then make them jealous, and that that mercy might then come back to them. 
This is Israel's future status. And he's saying that it's the exact same thing that's happened to you Gentiles. Don't boast. Don't brag. It's going to happen to them as well again. And so we see then uh, that in Paul's explanation as for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. They're without change. They're without repentance. This is when God gives a gift, he gives it forever. When God calls a person salvifically, he calls them forever. When God gives the gift of salvation and he justifies a person and regenerates them, those things are forever things. God calls you to his service. That is forever. And God, in the Abrahamic covenant, told Abraham, and also in Exodus, told Israel and called Israel as an ethnic national people to serve him. That calling is irrevocable. And this then all culminates in, the, in Paul's, in, in, in the, the grand purpose is that God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. At the end of the day, you're gonna look and see what God did and you're gonna see that he has been a God who's been merciful to all, merciful to, merciful to the Gentiles, and then merciful again to Israel. God is a God of mercy. And what I love, it, it, you could, guys, you, this is what, is happening in the world. This is the plan of God. This is what's unfolding before our very eyes every day. God is saving uh, saving a remnant of Jews now. He's saving a whole mass of Gentiles now. And in the future, he's going to then remove that hardening. He's going to be saving a mass of Israelites, Jewish people in the future. And that's so he's a God who shows no distinction. He's a God who shows mercy to whom he wills, who hardens whom he wills, and his intent is to be a God who has mercy on all. And what's so amazing is your and my life can be summarized in these two words. Disobedient. We were once disobedient. And then mercy. You were once disobedient, but God has shown you mercy. That's your whole life story. Go tell somebody about that. I was disobedient, but God showed me mercy. That's Israel's story. That's the Gentile story. And so then, do you see how we're all level now? There's no Jewish boasting against the Gentile. There's no Gentile boasting against the Jew. There's no Gentile pride saying, God's done with you. And there's no, you know, you're lesser one step below us. There's none of that. There's unity in Christ. It's amazing. God will show his mercy and he must show his mercy, for he's promised to show his mercy. In Isaiah 44, verse 22, it said, Remember these things, O Jacob, Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you, you are my servant. And listen to this, O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I, I've blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like a mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me, it says. God says to them, Horatius Bone, our Scottish poet and churchman, wrote this poem. He said, forgotten? No, that can't it be. Other names may pass away, but thine, my Israel, shall remain in everlasting memory. Forgotten? No, that cannot be. Inscribed upon my palms thou art. The name I gave in days of old is graven still upon my heart. Forgotten, no, that cannot be. Beloved of thy God art thou. His crown forever on thy head. His name forever on thy brow. Forgotten, no, that cannot be. Sun, moon, and stars may cease to shine. But thou shalt be remembered still. For thou art his. And he is thine. What do we say to this? What? We have to be in utter awe of God. God's faithfulness to Israel assures us Gentiles that he'll be faithful to us and that everything he's promised them, he's gonna fulfill it. And everything he's promised us, he's gonna fulfill it. Do you guys realize that the majority of the times that we think God is being unjust or that you know, the whole problem of evil, it, 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 
it doesn't make sense when you look at it from eternity. It doesn't make sense when you see the fulfillment of his word. It only, it, it only has a, a semblance of rationality in the here and now. You think that God should, isn't going to do what he said he's doing, that he's unfaithful because you don't see it right now. Look forward. Look ahead. By faith, we look forward. By faith, we look ahead. This is what, in Hebrews chapter 11, all these faithful people died without seeing what was promised to them. We look forward, we look ahead, we see the God who has mercy on all, and this God is the God who has laid out for us clearly how he intends to have mercy on Gentiles and then mercy on Jews, and it leaves us in awe, and it absolutely humbles us, and it should cause us to go and to preach the gospel to our Jewish friends. If you don't have a Jewish friend, that's your first mistake. If you have a Jewish friend, confess that to someone here, that you don't have a Jewish friend, and go find a Jewish friend, make a Jewish friend. Don't be weird and creepy. You know, serve them, love them, let them be your friend. So start there. But not only that, love the Jews, pray for them. Have the same unceasing anguish in his heart that, that Paul has for them. Speak up for them. Uh, one commentator, Michael Bird, wrote this, that there are some evil folks in the world who would like to do great harm to the Jewish people. Some want to drive all the Israelis into the Mediterranean. Some would like to, re to, uh, to reactivate the concentration camps of continental Europe. Others would like to blow up every synagogue in the known world. Whether that is neo-Nazis or Islamic extremists or even secular anti-Semites, many would do great harm to the Jewish people for no other reason than that they're Jewish. We have a responsibility to speak for them. They may be enemies of the gospel we preach, but guess what we do? We love our enemies and we preach the gospel to them. And we mourn and we anguish in our hearts that, that they, but to them belongs the, the covenants, but to them belongs the promises, and yet and to, to, to them from Christ, my Savior, the one who saved me, the one who, who, who changed my life forever and for all eternity the one who has preached to me, the one who assured me because of his death on the cross and his resurrection that my sins are forgiven and that the Father accepts me, the one who laid his life down and was put forth by the Father as a propitiation to bear my wrath and my penalty so that I could believe in him, so that I could receive the gift of God in Christ Jesus and have eternal life. That all comes from them. Do you not realize that? Are you, are you unaware of that? Do not be ignorant of this. Every blessing that we have as Gentiles has come to us through Israel. So I hope you appreciate them more. I hope that you're thankful. I hope that you go and you find a Jewish friend. You tell them that you read to your family Jewish stories every night. And that, and that you found hope in a Jewish savior who had 12 Jewish apostles who wrote a Jewish New Testament just for them. Tell them of these things. Who else is going to do it if you and I don't? Well, let me clarify that this does not mean that Israel as a nation right now can do no wrong. I think sometimes people go way off onto that side. Then they're untouchable in their current national state that we see them in. They sin just like us. Every nation sins. Every nation's leaders sin or are filled. All their positions are filled with sinners. So they're going to do wrong. There's going to be things that, that they do or ways that they react that they need to be held accountable for. And that we also, as, as loving neighbors, would point out to them. So Israel, it's not that, that Israel can do no wrong at all. We want to encourage Israel, pray for Israel, support Israel, go visit Israel. Meet, if, you don't, if you don't know how to find and make a Jewish friend, go to Israel. Go plant a church in Israel. Does anyone want to plant a church in Israel with me? <laughs> go, go, go. Share the gospel. 
This leads us then to think with Paul of the awe and the glory of, of God. Let's look at these verses. We have to be quick. He says, why was that funny? I keep saying that, huh? Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. When you see God's salvation plan unfolding and you see his mercy on all that he has handed them over in disobedience so that he could then mercy them, right? And he's handed others over and so that he might then mercy them and show that nobody deserves anything. All people are disobedient, deserving of hell, and yet God in his glory and his grace mercies people and saves them. You have, I mean, you, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom of God. God, you, you, you're, you're it's, it's incomprehensible, God. How unsearchable are his judgments. These are speaking of the ways that he's decided to act in history and salvation. How inscrutable his ways. We see here literally the unsearchable nature, how, how, how it's, it's, it's beyond figuring out. He goes on and says, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given him a gift to him that he might be repaid? And what I think is, 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 is neat about this statement is that multiple commentators point out a relationship between the, question, the, the, the exclamatory statements, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments, how inscrutable his ways, right? Those three statements, and then the questions that are asked. And so when you think about who's given a gift to him that he might be repaid, you think of, oh, the depths of the riches of God. Nobody, nobody gave to God first. God is completely self-existent, self-sufficient. He needs nothing. He doesn't need you. He didn't have to save you. You never did a thing for God that he would need to repay you. But yet, he saved you, demonstrated his mercy toward you, called you, said, come, follow me. I'll save you. I'll wash away all your sins. I'll make you right with me. I will, oh, I will, I will pour out upon you the abundance of my riches and, and mercy. What a God. But not only that, in, res, in, in connection with the, the statement that's made, who knows the mind of the Lord, matches the exclamation that how inscrutable his ways. Can you figure him out? Can can can? Can you understand the deep things of what God is doing? I mean, he shows you a little bit. We see a little bit of it here, but, but man, it's, it's, there's still so much more to it. And then we also see that who has known the mind of the Lord, or excuse me, who has been his, his counselor. And this draws out the implications of his unsearchable judgments. Nobody, nobody gave God any advice or wisdom on how he should conduct these things. God didn't say, you know, ask for man's opinion. God, infinite in wisdom and knowledge, said, this is how I'm going to do it. And I'm going to glorify myself through magnifying my mercy and salvation. And so it concludes then with from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. What do we see here? This is, this is probably the, definitely a verse you should memorize. But, but just a, an amazing, amazing three phrases that, that highlight God's absolute and utter sovereignty. David in his prayer recognizes this. He says in 1 Chronicles 29, 14, everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. In 1 Corinthians, right, Paul asks, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you've, you have received it, why do you boast as though you did not? Everything is from him, through him, and to him. And notice these go together. You can't separate these. If you're to say, oh, well, I believe in a God that everything, all things are from him. 
but not a God who all things are through and all things are to, then guess what kind of God you have? You don't have the God of the Bible. You have a deistic God. You have a God, you have a watchmaker creating the earth God. He just made it, set it up, and cool, like I don't, I'm not going to do anything else with it. But no, that's not our God. Our God, all things are from him. He's the source, originator of all things. He doesn't just make it and then leave it, but he shows his intimate, caring love for it. He upholds each and every single thing. He is the one through which all these things can continue to exist and take place. That if he was not functioning in that way, everything would cease to exist. He is the one who gives life to all things and gives breath to all things. We take these things for granted. And so often we think, God, where are you? Where are you, God? Not realizing that the very things that we're going through are from him and through him. But not only that, not only is God the originator, the source, not only is he the sustainer, the one through whom all things are done, but he is the goal of all things. All things are from him, through him, and to him. What does it mean that God's the, the, the goal of all things? He's the great end for which he himself exists. All things are to be done in a way that glorifies and, and, and magnifies God and his character. And so God, when we, we, we think in particular of salvation history and God's mercy being demonstrated and, and now people being saved and coming to know the Lord and some being shown mercy and some being shown wrath, we, we, we can't help but, but be humbled by the fact that God has shown us mercy and we can declare that from him, through him, and to him this mercy has been shown to us. And lastly, one fitting final declaration is to him be glory forever. To him be the glory forever. May he be the one we glorify. May he be the one we honor because there's no one else who's like him. There's no one else who's done what he has done. There's no one else who can compare in regards to wisdom, in regards to sovereignty. There are no other gods. All the gods of the world are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So glory be to him for his awesome mercy shown to us. Has awesome mercy been shown to you? If you're here and this mercy hasn't been shown to you, and it, you'd know that if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, and this mercy hasn't been, this salvific saving mercy hasn't been shown to you yet. I encourage you to come think about these things. Talk to me, talk to someone else. Turn to the Lord today. Don't leave this place in the same condition that you came in. All of us once were disobedient, but now we've been shown mercy. If you will call upon his name, he will save you and he will show mercy to you. For the rest of us who great mercy has been shown to, we declare to him, be the glory forever. And let me just point out one thing. Romans chapter 12, verse one. Now you get it. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God, what? Now we get the mercies of God that we are disobedient. Now we see mercy and mercies of God. What do we do? Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your mercy shown to us. To you be the glory. Pray as we meditate on these things, Lord, that that we would search the scriptures to see if these things are so. And God, I pray that we would be a people who are bold in our evangelism. We understand what you're doing in this world, God, and that we partake in it humbly and joyfully partner with Jews and Gentiles together in your church, Lord, to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.